Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to look at this subject, what the Bible says about life after death. And uh, what we're going to consider this afternoon is this life. We're going to consider the Bible. We're going to look at life after death, a new life, and then think about how it affects you and me. So, first of all, think about this life. And we know what is life? Well, simply, the natural life, we're born, we grow, we live our lives, and then we die. And no one of us know when or what time we will die. But that is what it is, isn't it? Life, we grow like that. And then, in some ways, it's like a circle of life, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> we've got there this circle of life where we start with birth we've got growth we've got reproduction and then eventually we die and that's the circle of life isn't it and whether we believe in the Bible or we don't that is fact isn't it that is life as it is through life I'm sure we all ask questions and the life's big questions affect us all and sometimes people ask things like why are we here? What's life all about? What's the point? What's next? Do we enjoy it while we can? Is life here today and gone tomorrow? What does the future bring? Is there life after death? Is God really real? You see, those are some of the questions that we might ask in our lifetime. And human nature as it is, sometimes when we get a bit older, we realise that uh, our life's coming to an end and, and perhaps we think about these things a little bit more. But... The fact is, that is life, isn't it? It is. And we know what happens. We go to the grave and we die. Is this life all there is? Well, surely we all need to ask this question, don't we? Uh, and the point is, the thing is we've got to ask is that, isn't it? There must be more to my life than how it is now and where, where do I find it out well that's why we've asked you here this afternoon because we believe that the answer to these questions is there in the Bible and the Bible well it's God's living word to you and to me and that's what it is it's a living word and within it there are things that we can look to in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 it says there all scripture is given by inspiration of God it's saying that it's God breathed it's his words that's coming to us but it doesn't just finish there because it then says and is profitable for teaching for proof correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, furnished unto all good works. So what it's saying is that the Bible that we have is God's word to us, but it's saying it's profitable to us to read it because it teaches us about life and about God's ways and it shows us that we can have a real hope for the future. So God communicates to us in this way. But the wonderful thing about the Bible, it communicates to us accurately, simply and clearly. And that's important to us, isn't it? We want the truth. And we need it saying to us in a way we can understand it. And that's what the Bible does for us. And we can understand what God is saying to us through his word. And all the answers that we need today are contained here in God's word. 
And God's word is important because it tells to us about his purpose from the beginning to the end. And we need to read it for ourselves. And when we do, we need to trust what God is saying to us is true. And the wonderful thing is, if we choose, and that's the point, we have the choice. If, if we choose, we can be part of God's purpose. The Bible is clear about what we're considering today, life and death. And what we need to do if we want to live. So our authority today is the Bible, God's word to us. And when we think about this subject, it is all centered around God's purpose. And God's purpose is that he is going to set up a kingdom. And I'd like you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 45, please. It reveals to us there God's purpose very clearly and very simply. And in verse 18 it says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heaven, God himself that formed the earth and made it. So anyway, it's telling us that the God of the Bible created heaven and earth and everything that's on it. And then it says, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, or he's not created it to be wasted, for man to even to waste it away, he has created it, verse, the rest of the verse, he says, he formed it to be inhabited, for people to live on the earth. And the reason he said that is that he wants people to trust in him, trust in his purpose, that this earth is going to be inhabited by people who trust God. In another part of the Bible, so that his glory will fill this earth. And so it says then, I am the Lord and there is none else. So he's saying that he is the only true and wise God and there are no others. He's the only living God. And he's asking us to trust him and trust his words. And he's saying in verse 22, words that are applicable to you and I today. He says, look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. He's saying, look to me, and you'll be saved. Left to yourself, whether we want to believe the Bible or not, we're going to die. That's it. But God is saying to us, look unto me, and be saved. That's what he's saying through his word. And so his purpose is that this earth is going to be inhabited by people who will take him at his word. And what God is saying to us is that he's going to set up a kingdom on this earth, the kingdom of God. Let's just have a look about that just a little bit. So turn with me to Psalm 145. Verse 12, God speaking here and saying, To make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. So what he's saying, that the kingdoms of men, they come and they go. But what he's saying here, he wants people to know about this kingdom that God is going to set up on the earth in the future where he says it's going to be an everlasting kingdom last forever now isn't that wonderful that God is saying that is what is going to happen I'd like you to turn to Daniel chapter 2 please And this tells us about a man, Daniel, who was taken captive into a strange land. He was a Jew who believed in God, 
and taken into a foreign land where people didn't believe in the God of the Bible. And there was a king over this nation and the nation was Babylon. And he was Nebuchadnezzar, the king. And we're told that he had a dream. And nobody could tell the dream, tell him what the dream meant, except for this man of God, Daniel. And Daniel is able to show him what it was all about. And he tells him about the kingdoms that will come. He says, like he saw this great image and he says you're this head of gold you're this head and after you come another nation and so forth he went through all the nations that have come and gone and then he talks about the feet of this nation and in verse 44 he talks about the times of the image having the feet of iron and clay where they don't mix they don't mingle and what he's saying is really like the times that we're living in now. Because there are strong nations, a weak nation, and they don't mix together. But what he's saying is in verse 44, he says, And in the days of these kings, and we believe that it's the times we're living in now, he says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Notice what it says. He's going to set up a king that will never be destroyed, and he emphasises it by saying it, doesn't he? And it shall stand forever. So what God is saying, that he's going to set up a kingdom that's going to last forever and ever, and he's going to set it up in a time where there is unrest, where nations are not getting on with different nations. And we're living, I believe, in those days now. And we believe very strongly that God is going to set up that kingdom very, very soon. So, please turn to Mark chapter 1. Because here we read words of Jesus Christ the son of God in Mark chapter 1 Jesus through his ministry was talking to the people about these things and in verse 14 he says now after that John was put into prison Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent ye and believe the gospel. So Jesus, the Son of God, believed in these things. He was preaching about this kingdom that is to come and how important that is. But what I want to say, my dear friends, is that this is a personal invitation by God to you and I to be in this kingdom. And what it's saying, it's an invitation to us all. Please, will you first of all look at Matthew chapter 6. Some more words of Jesus. And he talks here about what people should do. And he says there in verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. So what he's saying that we should seek, we could, should look for this kingdom to come and the way that we can be part of it. And what he's saying to us all is that we have to look beyond the grave because whatever, that's what's going to happen, isn't it? That's a fact of life, we're going to die. And what he's saying to us, we need to start a new life, a new way. And just as we saw the circle of life in a natural sense, I just want to show to you a new way, a circle of a new life. And again, it starts off by a new way that's shown through the Bible. And the message is for you and me. There's no doubt about it. 
and it talks about a new birth it talks about growth being fruitful and life and not just any kind of life it's everlasting life that's what God is offering to you and to me now this is what we're putting before you now is a new way of life a new circle of life that we can look to and be part of a new life in Jesus because he is set as an example of how we should be so what do we mean by a new life please go to Romans chapter 6 please Romans chapter 6 and he's talking here in verse 4 he says therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we also should walk in newness of life so what he's talking here that we've got to show a visual commitment to God through it's called baptism complete immersion in water and he's saying just as Jesus died and rose again so we when we're baptised we go under the water and you know naturally if we stayed under there we'd die but what happens we come up out of the water into a new way of life to start afresh our old sins forgiven and we start afresh and so it says there to walk in newness of life and that's what it means by a new life a new way not being reborn it's a new way of life and that's what it's saying to us to hear and then it talked about growth well let's have a look what the Bible tells us there 1 Peter and chapter 2 First Epistle of Peter, chapter 2, and verse 2. He talks here, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that they may grow. You see, it's using the natural, isn't it? A baby can only take the milk to help it to grow and to develop. But he's saying here, as, as newborn but just like newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word this is the word, the bible he's saying desire this feed upon this and then he said that ye may grow thereby so what he's saying we've got to give a commitment to God and the Lord Jesus Christ but then we must grow and develop and using the Bible as our guide of how we should live day by day that's what it means by growth and then it says <coughs> fruitful well what's he mean there well let's go to John's Gospel and chapter 1 sorry 15 chapter 15 and again the Bible uses these analogies of, of, of different things and he's saying here about a tree and we know a fruit tree it's grown to, to provide its fruit and what they do in the natural they prune it to make sure that they develop and grow and you get the best fruit and then if we look at verse 3 it says there now ye are clean through the word which hath spoken unto you he says abide in me this is Jesus and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me and I am the vine ye are the branches he that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit so what he's saying is that being in the Lord Jesus being associated with him and doing his will that's being fruitful because we are being grafted in like a, a tree with 
being grown into it so that we bring forth and Jesus is the main stem and we are the branches and he's saying that we can be fruitful if we abide in him and there are other verses in the Bible you know about these things so being fruitful is so important and it means that if we accept these things and we know it's true and sure then we want to tell other people about it that God has this great purpose which is centered in his son the Lord Jesus Christ so you and me what it's saying is a new life with a new future that's what it's saying that's what God is promising to you and to me a new future a hope of everlasting life think about that so new birth grow fruitful and we have life and not any kind of life it's that isn't it everlasting life that's what it says so we need to change isn't it change our direction in life we need to think about where we're going in life we know that we can enjoy life now but at the end it's death but if we focus and look to the Bible God's word to us and take on board what it's saying then we can look to the future with hope and even though we die we can still look to that future with hope because when Jesus returns back to this earth to set up that kingdom those that are dead will be raised from the dead and he will judge and see who is able to go into that kingdom isn't that wonderful that's what God is promising so choice we all have choices don't we whatever we're doing there is a choice and with the Bible there are only two choices it's either God's way or our own way and that equates to life or to death light and darkness that's what it is there's no in between we either go our own way and at the end we die that's it or we can choose to go God's way and through the Lord Jesus Christ we can have hope of life everlasting they're the options that are open to each one of us but we have the choice nobody can make us the choice is ours that's the one choice isn't it and that's the other one is life the other is life the difference being one leads to death and one to everlasting life see they're the two options aren't they and all we say to you please make the right choice it's not easy but God through his word is telling us clearly that these things are going to happen and he wants us to be there now isn't that wonderful he wants us to be in that kingdom it's my father's good pleasure Jesus said to give you the kingdom he wants us all there but he won't make us the choice is ours see we looked at Romans 6 just look at the very last verse of that chapter and it puts it very very clear what life is all about it says there for the wages of sin is death we all do things wrong and that goes right back to Adam when he disobeyed God and the consequence of that disobeying God is sin and when we sin we die and so he's saying there for the wages of sin is death but then he says but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and notice what it says it's a gift it's a free gift some of you remember but in the 70s they used to go to the petrol station and used to get all sorts of free gifts table mats and uh, all sorts of things if you bought the fuel but you see this is more important 
This is talking about life and death. And God is offering to you and me the gift, a free gift of life. And we're two choices here. We either carry on life and then we die. Or we change our way of life now and can look to the future and think about the kingdom of God and turn to God's ways. So, you and me, is this life all there is? With no hope and with no future. That's it, isn't it? The graveyards are full of them. Well, simply, the answer is, is this life all there is? No, it isn't. Definitely not. It is not. Because there is afterlife. There is that through reading and acting upon God's message, our Bible. And then it will give us hope for the future. We well, see the contrast between the two. That's what it's about, isn't it? And we read, people read for us, didn't he? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's turn to that now. And there we read, in verse 19, it says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, so if we only have hope in this life we live in now, it says there, we're of all men most miserable. Because that's it, isn't it? But verse 20 tells us differently, doesn't it? But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So Jesus, the Son of God, he lived and died that you and I might have hope. And he rose from the dead and now is at the right hand of God waiting that day that God has appointed to come back to this earth to set up that kingdom. So he's saying, for verse 21, for since man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For is that Adam, we all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So you see that God has provided a way of escape from sin and death and that's through his son the Lord Jesus Christ now isn't that fantastic that's what God has offered to us you and I Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 it says this I think it's lovely but God commended his love toward us In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's amazing, isn't it? That's God's love to us, that he gave his only begotten son, who had done nothing wrong, and yet he died, so that you and I can have this great hope for the future. Isn't that wonderful? So, you and me, what about it? It's a new year, isn't it? Well, the first month's gone now. But how about considering a new start, a new life, a new hope, a new future? And that new future is to look to everlasting life, God's kingdom. You know, everybody knows the Lord's Prayer, don't they? And it starts by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name then what does it say thy kingdom come now if we pray for that surely we believe it's going to happen and it is God's kingdom is coming on this earth very soon and that's what he's asking us to do wonderful isn't it that we have this great opportunity to do these things In the epistle of John, in chapter 1, 
sorry, chapter 5, verse 4, we read this. For whosoever is born of God, new birth, whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. We overcome the things of the natural. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now faith is trusting in God. And it's not by sight, it's by trusting that what God has said will happen, it will come to pass. It's believing in those things we cannot see, yet we believe that through his word, what he has promised will happen. It's some things we can't prove. It requires trust, it requires this faith within us. And without it, we can't please God. And so that's what it's saying. And then in verse 5, Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, he is. We've got to believe and act upon God's message of hope. That's a lovely picture, isn't it? A new day dawning. Is there life after death? Definitely yes. No question about it. Yes. There will be life after death. God has a great plan for the future. He's going to set up a kingdom on this earth very soon so there is life after death oh yeah now I can assure you I want to be part of that I do but the question is what about you thank you